Uh, this is just a little bit of the material that uh, was on the handout uh, the other day that went around uh, the plant looking at how real wages have declined, including here uh, at Honda. So the argument about blaming wages for the problem is less and less uh, reasonable. Uh, 10 cents an hour, let's assume for now that they do it twice, okay? You got the semi-annual 10 cents, let's assume you get another 10 cents next time, who knows? That will amount to a 0.6% wage increase uh, for the year as a whole. Uh, the reality was inflation in Ontario last year uh, was 3.1%. So the price of everything that you paid uh, went up on average over 3%, and you know where that came from, because you paid for it. So uh, the uh, wage increase was less than one-fifth of the value uh, of the inflation that you paid. That's why you experience a decline in your wages of 2.5% in a single year. That's a decline in your actual standard of living of 2.5% in a single year, uh, based on two semi-annual 10 cent increases. So that's how a 10 cent <coughs> increase in a way is a bit of an insult, um, because uh, they say that it's a, a wage increase, in reality, it's a significant wage cut. And that's not to say that, you know, times aren't tough all over. They are tough all over. Uh, but in the, in the case of a non-union facility, you don't even have the ability to negotiate over it or to put forward your own point of view. You just walk into the review meeting and you're presented with uh, the 10 cents as a fait accompli and they say, here you are, be happy with it. The reality is your real purchasing power is declining because the wages aren't even keeping up with uh, inflation. Of course, it was much worse than that because it wasn't just the 10 cents. There was also the change in the bonus that they uh, projected for the next uh, half year. So you got 10 cents an hour for the next half year from the wage increase. If you take the reduction in the bonus, which they said was to be, would be cut roughly in half, and divide that over the number of hours worked in the coming six months, you lost close to $1.20 per hour from the reduction in the bonus compared to the 10 cents an hour that you gained on the wage increase. So obviously, again, the net impact uh, is a decline in actual cash wages, let alone your uh, purchasing power, a decline in your actual cash wages uh, over the next six months of uh, more than a dollar an hour because the tiny increase in the wage was offset by a much larger reduction in the, um, uh, in the value of the bonus, uh, which they said would be cut roughly in half uh, over the next uh, six months. Um, we'll hear a lot about comparisons of the cost of Canadian auto workers to the cost of auto workers in other countries, and we always, as Canadians, seem to end up comparing ourselves to the Americans. They're the obvious neighbor, they're the most important uh, producer in the continent, and so the comparisons are often made between Canadian costs and prices and U.S. costs and prices, and I'm sure that happens at Honda as well. They're probably always comparing what's happening at Alliston to what's happening at Marystown. And they'll be saying that because the dollar is so high, your wages are too high, that's why we have to take these uh, measures to restrain wages and restrain uh, compensation. And this is where it's really important to understand a little bit about the economics of the loony, okay? The economics of exchange rates and what it means to have this roller coaster ride of the uh, Canadian dollar. This is the Canadian dollar expressed in US cents. So this is the exchange rate, how much American money we can buy with one of our loonies, and it is a bit of a roller coaster. For years it was relatively low, okay? For years, you'll remember, it was 60 cents, 70 cents, 80 cents, in that range. Then, starting around the turn of the century, it really took off. And the loonie went from the low 60s in 2002 to above par with the US dollar a decade later. So in the course of a decade, the dollar grew by over 60%. So that means the Canadian dollar's cost, if you like, internationally, uh, is very high relative to where it used to be. Now I put two lines on this graph. The red one just shows the 25-year average value of the Canadian dollar. You see there's a lot of ups and downs, but what is it worth in the long run? What's the average value? Just under 80 cents. The green line is another value that's important, and I'll explain this which is called the Purchasing Power Parity Value. PPP is the uh, acronym. Purchasing Power Parity Value of the Canadian dollar. This is where economists think the Canadian dollar should be. This would be its sort of fair value on the basis of comparing prices and costs in Canada to what prices and costs are in other parts of the world. And uh, by either measure, either by its long-term value or by its fair value, 
the Canadian dollar is way, way high. It's actually overvalued right now at par with the U.S. by almost 25% compared to where it should be and compared to where it traditionally has been. And this problem of an overly strong currency, well, it makes it very affordable to cross the border and go and do a little bit of shopping, right? And it makes it cheaper to go to Florida at, at spring break with the kids. The reality is, is it wreaks havoc with costs and investment and competitiveness in our uh, Canadian manufacturing operations. Um, and it means that while our costs are not high in real terms, they look high to international purchasers and international investors solely because of these uh, ups and downs on foreign exchange uh, markets. Now what do I mean by this concept of purchasing power parity? Purchasing power parity exchange rate is one that will accurately reflect differences in prices and costs between different economies. And it's not to say a theory of where the exchange rate will always equal purchasing power parity. As we saw in the graph, usually it doesn't. It's sometimes above it, sometimes below it. In the long run, it's usually on average close to purchasing power parity. But in the short run, it's kind of like the stock market. The foreign exchange market is like oil futures or the TSX or any other financial market where people are placing bets with huge amounts of money, often borrowed money, and that causes the prices to shoot up or down quite a bit in any given day. So in the short run, the exchange rate will not equal the purchasing power parity level. But even when it doesn't, it's an accurate measure of the purchasing power of money in different economies. And here's the root of the problem. Even though our dollar is high, which makes it look like we can buy stuff from foreign countries for cheaper, okay? It has not, in practice, led to lower consumer prices in Canada. That means that our purchasing power in Canada hasn't changed, okay? So, is that your experience? Have you seen that because the dollar is very high, has there been dramatic decreases in the prices of stuff that we buy because the dollar can buy more internationally? Not remotely. What do you think happens because the stuff is cheaper to bring in, but it's not cheaper when you buy it? Somebody's pocketing the difference, right? It's the middleman who's pocketing the difference. The company that brings in the stuff from overseas pays less for it because our dollar is strong, but charges you as much as they ever charged. And the reality is, our purchasing power parity has not increased at all. That's why the dollar should still be at that level of around 81 cents. That's what the economists think is a fair value for our dollar, is around 81 cents. Anytime we're above that, we look expensive, but we aren't getting a high real wage. We just look like we're getting a high real wage because of the distortion between the actual value of the dollar, which is at par now, and the true fair value of the dollar, which is uh, around 81 cents.